Hello everyone, um, welcome to Open Glam Now, the Swedish National Heritage Board's webinar series on open cultural heritage collections and institutions by digital means. My name is Larissa Borg, I am working at um, the Department for Digital Dissemination and I am going to talk today with you about copyright. Copyright between um, protection and democratic freedom will be the topic of today's session and we are going to discuss questions such as why should we use open licenses and what are the chances of releasing digital collections into the public domain. If you want to discuss this topic or um, this session in social media, please use the hashtag OpenGlamNow, for example on Twitter. And I'm joined today by three amazing guests. Um, first of all, my colleague Sofia Kuhlmann, who's working here at the Swedish National Heritage Board, and Diki Sam, she's a lawyer and working on legal questions concerning cultural heritage and above all when it's becoming digitized. And she's focusing on copyright in her everyday work. Then we have Rita Ojanpere. Um, she's joining us today from Finland and she's the collection, collections management director at the Finnish National Gallery. Mm -hmm. She's an art historian and she's also the editor-in-chief of the Finnish National Gallery's online publication, FNG Research. Um, today with Douglas McCarthy, who I'm going to introduce next, she has managed the FNG's going open access um, in 2018. And another art historian and open glamour at heart, um, Douglas McCarthy from Europeana. He's the collections manager for art and photography and he's an advocate for making cultural heritage openly accessible. He's also leading an international survey on open access um, policies in the glam sector, and which is doing together with Andrea Wallis from the um, University of Exeter. And I'm going to share the link to the survey um, with all of you afterwards. So thank you very much to all of you that you are with us today. And we're going to start with our first presentation. Um, hi, Douglas. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the nice introduction, Larissa, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, very much looking forward to discussing copyright, open access, and museum culture with you, and I look forward to your questions yeah, during all of the sessions and afterwards. So, as Larissa said, I am the Collections Manager at Europeana Foundation, and I'm speaking to you from Delft here in the Netherlands. And what I would like to do to open this morning's session is to zoom out a little bit and to focus on the big picture. So I would fundamentally like to suggest that open access is a important way and a tool for museums, libraries, archives and galleries to really connect with and power their mission as organizations. And my presentation this morning really has three main parts. First of all, we will look at museum missions. So we will look at what is your mission and see how open access may connect to that. We will also discuss what open means because there is often some ambiguity, uh, different definitions floating around. So I would like to introduce some clarity on that. We will look at the bigger picture of open glam around the world today. So what is the current picture of that and what's the Swedish context in relation to that? We will look at the opportunity that open data and open access presents for museums. So let's continue. Um, let's talk about the museum's mission. Uh, so. There was a survey done uh, a few years ago in the UK where they brought together, they aggregated and analyzed keywords from missions of museums, libraries, archives and galleries. And what you can see on this slide is a word cloud presentation of that. And if we look at it, we can see some quite common themes, words and values that are represented. For example, people is quite prominent learning, history, enjoyment, 
understanding, collections, community, for example. And when we look at the missions of GLAMS in Sweden, in the UK, and actually all over the world, there's a very consistent sort of remix of these words, uh, usually about two or three hundred words, where a statement sums up what the values and what the key mission and intention is of institutions. And that's fairly consistent in the cultural sector. If we accept this, I would then like to ask you to self-reflect on how those missions connect to the copyright policies, the image rights and reproduction policies that museums operate, whether they are open, sometimes semi-open, or in fact completely closed and rights reserved, we could say, for public domain artworks. How does that image policy connect to that bigger mission of museums? Is it complementary or is it actually obstructive? Something to think about. Let's also clarify what open access means. Quite often you will hear people talk about free access when they are promoting their museums. Isn't it fantastic that you can access these collections for free? You see that in tweets, in posts, in press releases. To, to oversimplify this, we could say, though, that free access means, well, yes, I can see it. Mm, great. But it's not open access. Open access really means that I can use it. I can use it in an educational piece. I can use it in my curriculum. I can remix it for a creative artwork. I can post it online without worrying about copyright infringement. So free access is really not open access. And I think it's important for us today and generally in our jobs and work to, to remember this. So let's go into a little bit more detail about what open access can mean and how it can be defined. In my research work, I like to use what's called the open definition this was developed by the Open Knowledge International several years ago and they have a nice one sentence summary of open access and I will quote it here. Open means that anyone can freely access, use, modify and share for any purpose. Later today we will look at with Sophia more detail about copyright right statements and licenses. So I only put up on this slide the open definition compliant licenses and right statements. These are the tools that the open definition says are open access. You will see some familiar licenses, for example, CC BY SA, CC BY, the public domain mark and CC0 are also there. And you will note no known copyright, which is from the rightstatement.org. We will encounter these licenses and legal tools later this morning. Quite often you will hear people say, well, what about non-commercial or no derivative licenses, NC or ND for sure? Well, according to the open definition, and according to me, I'm sorry, that is not open access. Those are restrictive licenses which prevent many useful kinds of reuse around cultural heritage. For example, adding an image to illustrate a Wikipedia article or uploading it to Wikimedia Commons for that purpose. So non-commercial and no derivative licenses are not truly open access, I want to suggest. So what's the global picture right now open glam around the world. Well on this map you can see a simplified presentation of countries where open glam, open access policy in cultural heritage has been identified and recorded. You'll note I'm sure that there are quite a few countries, many parts, regions of the world where open access has not yet penetrated and I think that's something that we can reflect on in the cultural heritage sector to say that 
is open access primarily a Western or a, a European and North American practice? And if that's true, why is that? And how can it be spread appropriately to other countries? The data behind that map comes from a major survey which Larissa mentioned in her kind introduction. I've been conducting for the last 18 months with Dr. Andrea Wallace of the University of Exeter, uh, my research partner. And the Open GLAM survey examines how GLAMs make open access data, whether digital objects, metadata or text, available for reuse. This is the current picture of Open Glam in Sweden. And as you can see, it's quite a positive picture. There are dozens of Open Glam instances that we have recorded in Sweden, and many of these institutions will be, of course, very fi familiar to you, and perhaps you, you work for one of them. Which licenses and rights statements are Open Glams in Sweden using? Well, here's the picture you can see that the public domain mark is quite popular, it's well used. Almost 50% of open GLAM in Sweden comes with the public domain mark. You'll also see CC BY, CC0 and CC BY SA in action. So what we can conclude from this image is that the Creative Commons legal tools have been well used and are well taken up in Sweden. And there is also no known copyright, the rightstatement.org statement, which I mentioned earlier, that has also appeared in Sweden. One thing that I would like to illustrate with you is that open access scope is an important concept. The Open GLAM survey records instances of open access by GLAMs. Now, these are often small in scale, relating to perhaps a few hundred or a few thousand digital objects, and they're often exceptions to a GLAM's overall policy and practice. Therefore, survey inclusion does not mean that a GLAM has a blanket or a universal open access policy. In the survey, open access scope indicates this. It shows whether a GLAM has released some or all of its eligible data on open access terms. So this is a detail, but it's a very important detail to understanding Open GLAM in three dimensions. In summary, to echo George Orwell, we could say all Open GLAM instances are equal, but some are more equal and perhaps more meaningful than others. Open access scope in Sweden looks like this. Around 60% of recorded instances of open access relate to some eligible data. So not everything, not all of the public domain works where there was never copyright or copyright has expired. And around 40% of institutions apply open access policy to all of their eligible data. And this is a moving picture. It will change over time as policies are adapted and as they mature. If we take in the entire Open GLAM survey, which currently has around 650 institutions around the world, this is the picture of open access scope. Relative to Sweden, it is more limited in that less than 30% of institutions have released all of their eligible data on open access terms. 70% have only some eligible data. So there is an opportunity for GLAMs, yes, in Sweden and also around the world to increase and to extend their open access policy to more of their public domain collections. Why is this important? Why does it matter? I would like to suggest that structured open data is a, a fantastic opportunity for museums, libraries, archives, and galleries. And I want to share just two examples to inspire you. Structured open data really powers our daily lives, our interactions online with our smartphones, 
with browsers, in all kinds of ways which perhaps we don't realize. Structured open data, for example, information in Wikidata, is powering, is generating information for many commercial tech services such as Google, Google Images, the Knowledge Graph. Voice services like Alexa and Siri also rely on Wikidata for running their services and providing relevant information. So structured open data here, I'm suggesting, is a, like a Swiss army knife. It is a incredibly powerful and multifunctional tool for our daily lives and connecting cultural heritage information to this ecosystem is a, a fantastic opportunity to make our collections more relevant. In the library sector, we can see some really interesting work around Wikidata. Um, I would recommend, and it is linked here, following the work of Jason Evans at the National Library of Wales, who has been mapping manuscript metadata into Wikidata to understand and create a whole new network of related information inside their collection and also relating their collection to other collections and to the wider picture of library data. Jason's presentation on this called Wikidata in GLAMS How and Why has much more information if you're interested in reading it afterwards. Open GLAM so far has been presented as a copyright, as a legal, as perhaps a technical, a data related phenomenon. However, I'd like to suggest that we are moving towards what I'm calling Open Glam 2.0 quite quickly. And I want to mention one or two examples of what that includes. Open Glam can also be considered as a community, a group of shared spaces, mostly digital, sometimes physical, and a set of shared values. Ethics is an increasingly important part of Open Glam. For example, considering repatriation and avoiding exploitation of colonial, colonially connected objects through digitization is a current piece of work. And here are linked uh, two articles, one from The Times by my colleague Andrea and her research partner Mathilde Pavis. And the other resource is linked to uh, Maori culture and heritage in New Zealand. So there are ethical considerations which we should bring to bear, we should think about and recognize when we're talking about open glam beyond a copyright, a legal and a technical understanding. I also recommend this paper uh, developed by the First Peoples in Australia and this is around how we can increase, enhance engagement with indigenous communities and the museums and galleries world. Many of these ideas are being summed up and collected in what we call the Open Glam Principles. Next year, probably in May 2020, there will be an updated declaration on what open access and cultural heritage means today. And I added a few links here for your reference and the opportunity is, a, is live now for you to get involved in sharing your ideas and reflecting on the revised set of Open Glam principles which will come next year. To keep in touch with all of these conversations, I usually recommend following Open Glam as a hashtag on Twitter. So to conclude, I'd like to suggest that open data empowers citizens to reuse content in creative and independent ways. Open data connects Glam collections with the web and it enables many in creative and new partnerships, adding extra value to a museum's mission. I recommend that we use standardized tools and infrastructures wherever possible. Don't reinvent the wheel. And to conclude, please be open in your data, your thought, and your practice. So tuck or thank you, and I look forward to your questions today, this morning, and afterwards. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Douglas. That was a great presentation and there are many aspects that I am curious about to hear more about. Um, I want to um, tell the audience that we are going to share all links of Douglas also in the documentation on our website. There is one question on uh, structured open data. Doug, is structured open data the same as linked open data? Uh, yes, it's, there is a big overlap between the two. Um, I would say that we know that the, the different sectors or the different components of GLAM, for example, the library sector versus museum sector, they have many different systems, mappings, um, vocabularies, ontologies for managing their data, which are quite different from one part of the sector to another. And I feel that one of the great opportunities and actually realities now with, with Wikidata, for example, is that it is enabling better and more powerful mapping across all of these different systems and methods of um, cataloging data. Great, thank you very much. Just um, for everyone to create some synergies here, um, if you're interested in linked open data, that's uh, one of the sessions we're going to have um, uh, in the next few weeks. And if you want to learn more about Wikidata, please uh, look at the um, our last session um, with Liam Wyatt, who also introduced the Wikiverse. So this is, as I already introduced her, Sofia Kuhlmann, uh, and lawyer at the Swedish National Heritage Board. Welcome, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, copyright. And uh, unfortunately, it's complicated. We have to start there. It's an international field, so we have to start with uh, the international level. The Berne Convention and the TRIPS Treaty, so, uh, those are international uh, treaties. These treaties are something that we, uh, as a nation, have to live up to. Our national uh, leg legislation has to comply uh, with these regulations. There are also EU regulations, as I'm sure you know. Um, sometimes the EU regulation uh, and some international treaties take after our uh, legislation and our solutions, but not very often, <laughs> but they can go both ways sometimes. Right, this is our uh, uh, law, Lagomuppfrätt, uh, Swedish Copyright Act. Um, and this is based on the other Nordic countries that we, our legislations were developed uh, together. So they're very similar, but still some differences. So what's the point of this? Um, the Swedish Copyright Act is based on the continental view on copyright. Mm -hmm. um, there are different um, sort of uh, tracks of copyright regulation. Um, we have uh, the view that copyright consists of economic rights and moral rights. They are one and the same. Uh, in the common law system, that is uh, the UK and, and America and those uh, countries, they say that copyright, that's economic rights. And then the moral rights are a separate issue. So when we talk about copyrights with other people, uh, this can get complicated because we mean one thing, they mean another. Uh, and the practical implications of this is uh, one that I stumbled upon myself. It's, it's very difficult to translate this because we have different uh, pre-understanding of what we're talking about. So this can make it difficult in international context when we're trying to talk. Right, uh, right statements. Uh, this is one of the areas when we try to translate and we, we say, well, this, uh, this picture, for instance, is uh, copyright protected. We use the symbol uh, C in a circle, and most people know what that means. Uh, we also have the public domain, just the abbreviation, and most people understand that, uh, what this means except they really don't, because the copyright in the circle is actually an, an old American symbol. Uh, in the American system uh, previously, uh, you had to register uh, a copyright item. 
you had to uh, apply to the authorities, say, I created this, I made a book, I took a picture, I painted something, and then you had to apply this symbol to it, and then it was copyright protected. That's actually what the symbol means. We think of it as, oh, this is copyright protected. Uh, so it's a bit confusing. That's why right statements from rightstatements.org are very practical. They have uh, 12 international right statements uh, developed for, especially for the cultural heritage sector. So in my next picture, you see this one in copyright. That's a better symbol than the C in a circle. You see, it's kind of similar, so you recognize it. Um, but do people know what this means when they see this symbol? Well, probably not, because it's not commonly used yet. And the clever thing is that you link it to the page where the description is. So if you click on this symbol, you come to description uh, online, which is also translated into many languages. So you can uh, get a full understanding of what it means. Um, I took uh, an example of one other uh, marking. Uh, you see non-commercial use only. If you click on it, you see exactly what that means. Right, licenses. So normally when you create a work, you have the exclusive rights to it. So you can say, I'm going to put this in my desk and no one can ever see it. It's your right to do that. You can also tell a publisher, well, you can publish it and then sell it if I can get the proceeds from it. Or you could tell your friend, you can use it if you say I'm king of the world. You can make any sort of... Uh, that's the, the thing about uh, copyright. Uh, you start... Uh, that's the, the base of it. You, you decide what can be done. If you have a work that is really popular, you'll have a problem because say a thousand people want to use your picture and you have to make a deal with every one of them. You can have written contracts if you want, but if you're popular, like I said, uh, this can be a problem. So you can use a license and it's uh, like a package deal. So I illustrated that with a box. You, you actually say you can use my work uh, on these conditions. Uh, and the common condition is, of course, uh, to say that I was the creator of this work. And so uh, we are quite used to the Creative Commons licensing. They are free licensing tools that you can use. Um, so they come with the conditions uh, from the start. Um, you have to name the author uh, next to the picture, like I did with this photograph of the building where we work. You see that it's by Bengt A. Lundberg. So that's the condition of the CC BY license. Uh, now everyone can use this picture if they remember to say that it's by Bengt A. Lundberg. Uh, and they can uh, yeah, reuse it freely. So this is an open license. And they don't have to write these contracts with everyone. Now, public domain is an, an interesting story. Um, in, pub in Sweden, we actually don't have the concept of public domain but we still have public domain works, of course. Uh, public domain means that uh, the, the work, either the rights have expired, because uh, after a, a certain period of time, the rights expire, or they were never protect protected to start with. So these are two uh, markings uh, that you can use, uh, the public domain on the top, um, and then there's CC0, and this is complicated uh, because it's not really public domain. Um, and it's not license either. So uh, CC0 means that the, the author has said, I'm placing this in the public domain, uh, some call it. Uh, you just relinquish all rights and say everyone can use it. You don't even have to say that I'm the author. So it's completely free. So for the end user, these are the same. It's free, I can use it any way I want to. But to the person creating it, it's a difference. Yeah. So when do uh, rights expire and um, work become public domain? You see here a list and it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. So it's 70 years after the author died, 50 years after the object was created, 
for some rights, and 70 years after a phonogram was created, 15 years after the database was created, and coming soon, two years after an, an object was published. Uh, so it's getting even more complicated as we speak, <laughs> almost. Um, yeah, it, there's no simple answer if someone asks, oh, when, does, uh, when do rights expire? Well, there's a whole list. Uh, really, really old objects are free. So if you're looking at a map from the 18th century, you're pretty uh, sure that it's free. Um, but other than that, it can be complicated, sadly. So that's pretty much my conclusion. It is complicated. Uh, there are treaties you have to adhere to. Um, there are national laws that differ. So you have to take that into account when you speak to others. Uh, so these right statements and the commonly used licenses make it easier in an international con context because you understand um, there is a, this link to a page with an explanation that you can go to. And um, someone has um, translated it to your language, hopefully. Um, so this makes it easier for you when you publish something, and it makes it easier for the end user. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia, for your presentation. Um, there's already one question. Mm -hmm. um, what is a non-original photograph? <laughs> Yeah, that's a difficult one. Um, when you get into the copyright uh, issues and we have to make these determinations, what kind of object is this? It's, uh, it's impossible to say. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, very much dependent on uh, uh, the work it had. So, okay. so there are no simple rules uh, to follow, uh, sadly. Do you have an example for a non-original photograph? It's, um, well, <laughs> it's very difficult to say, but they, they are, if you, if you take the other example of an original photograph, mm -hmm. they are, um, well, they are planned and thought out, okay. maybe placed people in a certain way and okay. put the lighting on in a certain way and made them more artistic. There are more options uh, for the photographer okay. uh, in a way. If you're just snapping a picture mm -hmm. on the go, it's more likely to be a non-original photograph. Okay. But uh, yeah, there are always exceptions yeah. to that rule. I imagine this also to be quite difficult when we're talking about, for example, social photography, when yeah. we're sharing uh, photographs of social media uh, on yeah. social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are taking those photographs <laughs> so quickly. Is that um, yeah, an original or non-original? Yes, and then the photogra photographers themselves are always going, going to say that well, with this photo, this is very uh, high yeah. quality, this is original. Yeah. And then the courts have their say. Okay. So, yeah. I think we are, in Sweden we also have this expression of um, that there is an artistic um, influence on yeah. the picture. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's um, that's really interesting and difficult in the everyday yeah. life, I guess. Yes. Um, but there might also be this difference between when you, t for example, digitize an object and you take mm -hmm. a photograph. Yeah. Then. Um, yeah. Yes, in in theory, when you use a camera to to digitize something, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a photograph, mm -hmm. so it's protected. Yeah. Um, which can be quite a problem. Yeah. <laughs> There are some uh, questions that I'm going to um, read to you. So is there a difference between staged and spontaneous photographs in this um, topic? Well, yes. Um, if it's staged, it's uh, more likely to be an original photograph. But you can't, you can never say it's always this way. It uh, really depends on the, the picture. And um, there's another um, example from Spain that um, courts in Spain have tended to decide that, for instance, photojournalism tends to be non-original, um, which is quite contro controversial, or aerial photography as well, um, as examples for this um, non-original um, photography. I think, as you just said, it's really controversial and um, we're at the heart of the discussion uh, there. Um, are there any more questions? Um, are there any differences um, between photographs that include people and those that don't? 
Well, there's a separate issue there um, with personal data. Um, you have to take a look at the GDPR regulation uh, if there are people in the picture. Um, so copyright-wise, not really an issue. So you said, for example, that you can use a photograph, um, you can uh, release a, p a photograph when it's 50 years old, right? Um, are GDPR rights then also expired? No, the GDPR rights uh, are based on whether the person is alive or not. <laughs> so okay. you have to <laughs> look into that. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, wait, I missed a question. Could moral rights of the creator of an artwork conflict with um, remixes of that artwork? Um, yes, they can, actually. Um, so in the Swedish Copyright uh, Act, uh, the author has the, the right to decide how their work is used and, and in what um, circumstances they are published and shown. So if, uh, for instance, uh, there's a famous court case when uh, someone used a photograph uh, in an advertisement for a pornography magazine, and uh, of course the author of the photograph was uh, very upset about this. So that's, um, yeah, there's that issue. Okay. So from the Netherlands to Sweden and right now to Finland, um, I'm going to um, introduce you to Rita Ojanpere, um, who is uh, going to join us from Finland. So hello everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Rita Ojanpere and I'm working as Director of Collections Management at the Finnish National Gallery. And I've been involved in this organization in our open data policy. We have taken from the very beginning, which uh, is to say since 2012, to give you some facts. So we are the biggest art museum organization in Finland with the National Gallery, and we are three museums, but we're one collection. And now when we're talking about the whole collection, but mostly what I'm talking about is um, uh, data connected with the artworks in our collection, but also archival material. And the, the set is at the moment about um, 42,000, 42, and more than half of that is basically copyright free. So that is the amount of artworks or, or data connected to those artworks. The sort of preconditions of a very active uh, digitizing policy in Finland on a national level. And the Finnish National Gallery was part of this since 28. And this has been run and, and also funded by the Finnish Ministry of Culture. My organization as a national gallery has done is very much connected to, to the national policies but also of course as we can see because this is sort of this is a case study so i'm going to tell you very shortly what happened so uh, together with the digitizing we have been sharing our um well let's say early on if 2007 is early on so we we opened a website which has nothing to do with sort of open access in the in the meaning but we're talking about it today we have a national um, online service called Finna, and uh, also Europeana was part of the policy from its very beginning. So when Europea started launching its uh, its pilots, it's not about open access policy. Actually, this is about um, making the collection data seen. What happened in 2012 is sort of the, the beginning of the, the actual story. And um, we were contacted by some open glam activists and Wikimedia activists. Uh, Douglas was talking about earlier, so we're talking about the sort of European uh, sector of open glam uh, activists and agents who also in Finland through official channels like the Ministry of Culture. 
who has been guiding our work, but who have acti actively contacted us and sort of actively persuaded also the Finnish National Gallery to take new actions. And in 2012, um, I got the permission from the director general of my organization to sort of take the first step, which means that we had digitized archival materials like photographs and could proceed to share a set of these archival materials online. And we chose to use the CC BY SA 3.0. Uh, license. We tried a little bit to present and make this material usable. It was not a very big thing, but it was the beginning. Next year, the one of our museums, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Kiasma, took an initial um, with Open Knowledge Finland Association, and um, there was an Apps for Finland competition that fall the Kiasma uh, agents participated there. And this was the point where we created an API for the collections data, but not photographs for the, for the metadata, which was all already shared on our own collections website. So this was clearly a step forward. The data was not good. It was not, I mean, it was not organized, it was not clear enough. So in fact, this, this was a step, but it did not um, end up in too much in uh, when we think of uh, other, other partners outside our museum really using the data, but that was something. This was just to show that we opened the API on the, on the website. And then we evaluated what had happened and really we talked about the quality of the data and the parts in order to proceed towards more open licenses and sort of to get forward with this policy, which was not a very sort of um, official policy. It was sort of growing a little bit here and there. So, but anyway, 2016 was the year when we first shared uh, images of artworks. A museum like ours very often think of images of artworks as something that we can earn money with by selling them. Um, in fact, we still do, but, but anyway, we chose about 50 images from the oldest part of our collection and we share them in the Flickr application. This is just to show that uh, social media was active already, of course, at that time. And we tried to present and sort of make it interesting for our audiences via social media to show, use the images that were license, CC license and not only look at them. Europeana to Egypt it was a project that was sort of launched to us via the Finnish Ministry of Culture. And uh, so we, like other the 28 European countries, chose um, images of Finnish artworks from our collections and they were shared then on this platform uh, in the context of this Europeana to AG project. So this was also one initial to, to get forward. And here Europeana via the ministry was the, the party to, to sort of push it forward. Then we're sort of proceeding the, I, of course, I don't want to say it's an end because it's not supposed to be an end, but, but something which sort of was a bigger, a more crucial step to take. Now, first of all, of course, like I think all museums and at least art museums have been looking up to Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and Staten's Museum for Kunst in Copenhagen as sort of benchmarks for how open access image sharing, especially considering artwork images, is sort of supposed to look like in our present world and in the future. 
But we had a two-way process. We have a, a program in our museum. We can send our, our professionals abroad for two months to work as in, in as a residency. Um, visitors in organizations. And uh, so we had the chance of sending one of our professionals to the Europeana office. And um, the initiative then from Europeana was that we would upgrade the collections data in Europeana, which means more um, bigger, bigger JPG images of the artworks whose metadata was already there. So this was the point where the very important discussions were uh, happening inside our own organization. So because of this, not say maybe offer, but this question that was really posed to us, would this be the time for you really to take the step to open the uh, artwork images uh, with an open license. So in fact, very long discussions within our organization, the decision was finally taken. And somebody has um, asked sometimes that what is the most difficult thing to, to go through when you fight to open up and then to share the, the material uh, CC or otherwise license. So I would almost say that it is to take the decision to sort of decide that there are many things which we can win if we do what we then decided to do. So in February 15th last year, we launched uh, around uh, 12,000 images and we had decided to choose the CC0 license. And why is that? Our benchmarks had done the same. That was one thing. Also, we know that there's no way of controlling the requirements. So we cannot check, we cannot control, nobody can. So why not let go and just relax in that respect? And of course, the expectation then after the decision was for International Gallery's public image uh, would uh, become even more uh, visible, more stronger. And, and also there was an idea that uh, taking this step is a way to evoke interest and also in that way to get more visitors uh, in the museum, actual visitors. In social media, the reaction was immediate and very positive. So the, um, uh, the, the social media hits had the best coverage of the year. Uh, in that way, maybe it's not it's yet exaggerating to say that the open access policy really responded to our audience's needs and expectations. And that was, of course, very nice to see. So what we did, what we did we learn? Um, the effects. Uh, one very important effect, of course, was to enforce our international co collaboration, also via Europeana, which was a very important uh, partner here. Uh, another lesson learned was maybe that there was no harm done. I mean, we have not faced any negative response, so. It was not dangerous in the end to our organization. <laughs> uh, so at this point, it, it also almost feels like that opening, so following this, this path is sort of business as usual in an organization like us. Our limitation is that so far we don't share high, res high resolution images um, freely. The discussion deals with the positive economic effects, whether they might be negative or positive. So we're working on, on that. This was just to show what happened then within Europeana. So while our uh, professional was working there, 
So already we could uh, have a very nice chance to share an uh, uh, exhibition online where our collections were well presented. So, and now I was talking about our own collections website or uh, earlier shared our data. So just to let you know that we just last week opened a new one. It's still being sort of developed. And, and this is now uh, together with Europeana, the place where you can download the, the image and see the, the sort of indication when you open the, the files of each artwork. So why open access? Of course, partly because our collections belong to the Finnish people and they are part of our common European cultural heritage. So we want to guarantee open access, but also encourage participation in allowing creations and discoveries among larger audiences than before. We still think that active and innovative online presence activates pot potential visitors. Of course, when you open CC0, so the, the idea is that you actually don't know what's happening, who's using the images and what's happening there. But what we do know is that uh, students and teachers are using the material and they've been glad to sort of face the new situation. Of course, we want to enable the use of our collections data in creative software technologies and sort of the, the overall impact of this kind of policy, because uh, I think, and I think we think, that uh, supporting open societies sort of is one of the targets also of enabling easy and free access to our common heritage. So this is a sort of, uh, ideological statement in the end. This is an autumn image from our collections, one of the images that we share CC0. Please be free to, to use the images that we share the, however you, you want to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rita. That was really interesting to listen to um, how you explain the development of the Finnish National Gallery um, within the Open Glam context, and especially that you said that it's an ongoing process. Um, so um, I have, in fact, a question to you, and um, I'm curious, you mentioned that internal discussions within your museum were quite a challenge during the process of launching the Open Access Policy. Um, can you explain that a little bit further? Because, I mean, it was bubbling under for many years. Of course, we were, uh, since uh, 2012, which was the sort of beginning of the story, we started to be quite well informed of the um, open glam sectors, sort of um, the ideas that, that are being sort of uh, pushed forward there. But I mean, just, uh, I think one of the, the most difficult things was to, first of all, to think that, I mean, to, to let, let go with the, the, the fact, I mean, who, who can define meanings and who can, I mean, if, if you just let go someday, anybody can say anything, anybody can use our images in context, which are sort of not good from our, our marketing procedures, uh, for instance, have become more and more free and sort of relaxed during the last years. But but it not so it's not so very long ago when we were very strict about. I mean, you are not allowed to cut it, and we absolutely want to know inside the museum what you are saying about it. And and I mean the the sort of. Um, the, the context. So this, this was one thing, so that the sort of mental ownership of, of meanings. And the other one that we're going to sort of lose income. And uh, 
Yes, so these, I think these were the, the two most important issues in the discussion. What then the last argument when we're sort of almost there? It was the, the, the meeting of all the directors, the museum directors, the director general, economic director of the museums where I once again presented also, this is open access, it means this and this, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, this and this museum, like the Stratton's Museum for Kunst has done, it looks like this, and here's the tab where you see this is a zero indication, etc., etc. So then, I mean, that was, that was the point where the decision was made. But then, well, because I think that just Personally, I think that this is something which is going to happen, that it was this apt to happen. Thank you very much, Rita. Um, you mentioned an argument often used against open access in the cultural heritage sector, revenue generated by image sales. So what are your institution's experience after going open access? Have you experienced a loss in income? I don't think we, we have. No. Because, um, I mean, you cannot really say what uh, results from what, but the Finnish National Gallery has had enormous amount of, so uh, increase of visitors. And I mean, the, the income, if we're talking about um, economic income, when we talk about small museums, so I think it sounds a little bit, um, not so nice to say this because we're a, muse a big museum with a bigger budget, but uh, the, um, the amount of in which possible to get from, or, and which we're still getting from, from selling the high-res images, in a way it is marginal and, and more and more the sort of business idea is to produce products and sell those products not actually get the income by selling the actual files. Thank you very much, Rita. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I just want to mention that we discussed the topic of revenue generation um, out of um, digitized images last session. And there are some interesting research um, papers that there are actually no um, institutions that uh, generate income or, as Rita said, only marginal income from selling um, digitized images, um, but um, uh, because um, you always have to include the costs of, for example, the staff members that have to answer emails um, and the whole infrastructure that you have to build around it, um, so the administrative costs. Um, so it was really interesting what Rita just said, that um, they are building products out of their digitized images and are selling those. I would like to close this session to, um, with a question if, we, um, if um, there are um, small institutions, small rural Swedish institutions today that are joining us that have uh, small um, but um, nice digital collections, what would your like three to five sentences be to them to um, dare to share their collections online? I would say don't be intimidated by some of the examples that we often talk about from major and often national galleries or museums. It's okay to start small, be modest, um, begin with a perhaps one particular collection or a small set and use that to experiment with open access in a way that's feasible for you based on your staff time and your resources. And you can monitor the progress of that learn from it and build on it to do greater things. I know, well, in Finland, I know small museums are very often working in uh, cities. And, and I think there the budgeting and the idea that if there is something that you can earn money by, like selling any, like selling just more images, but anyway, you can get just some euros. So, so they sort of want to stick to that. So I really would persuade 
museums and of course their funders especially to to think about it more widely because it's not only about losing losing money you can get in the visitors and in the present world i mean you can you can offer them services products etc cetera, etc cetera. and 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 i would think but of course i'm not one uh, one working in a small museum that it would not be so difficult to compensate the income that comes from the images open up i mean that's another thing um I don't know if small museums are really sticking to this idea of of sort of mental and uh, uh, ownership, like if if these museums are afraid and scared of the effects, but and especially we we very often exaggerate the effects of our procedures which is of course also frustrating i mean when we do this we think that okay everybody is going to say this i mean mostly our environment is less upset and less interested than we would sort of hope for so thank you very much everyone for being in this uh, session and for taking part that was a very vivid session uh, so far, many questions, and I think that also demonstrates how difficult and how controversial the topic of copyright is. So don't hesitate to get in touch, um, just like this sweet cat does. Um, I'm really happy um, to have met you, and um, I hope you can take away as much as possible from this session. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers here in the Netherlands and in Finland. Thank you very much um, and have a nice day.